Electricast. Hold on to your butts. We are changing the course of history as we see it. That is what Wesker demands. Now this affects Iris. Um, Iris, where are you? What you feel only matters to you. I do not entertain hypotheticals. The world as it is is vexing enough. Iris, I have a tip for you. Don't take drugs! Or whatever movies with Wesley and Iris. What up and welcome to Or Whatever Movies. I'm your co-host, Iris, and I am here with a bladder full of hot air, my brother. <laughs> my name is Wesley, and I'm a shootist. Do you prefer bladder full of hot air or scourge of the sagebrush? Oh, scourge of the sagebrush, the terror of Tucson. <laughs> My older brother, Wesley, and we're talking today, if you haven't already guessed it, a movie from 1995, The Quick and the Dead. Had you ever seen it? Nope. And as a self-proclaimed Leo fan, it's crazy that I haven't seen this. (laughs) Who's impossibly young in this, by the way, like painfully impossibly young. Okay, for this one, I will say that the kid is an appropriate moniker because this is the one where he looks like a child. And yet he was, <laughs> can you imagine? That dude was 20 years old, but he looks like he's 12. He even gets a smooch from Sharon Stone. Yep. Was that a legit smooch and did they do it? I mean, it was implied that they did it. It might have been icky on film, but I mean, Russell Crowe might have been slightly more age appropriate and they did it too, but it got cut out of the, the movie. Wait, they did it too? Oh, Reverend. Yeah, he's quoting Bible verses and stuff. And she like backs him into a corner in a rainy hotel room. It's in the international release. So they kept it platonic between them for the U.S. release just so that the final showdown feels like more compadre than sex motivated. Compadre? (laughs) Well, also she takes off. Like that's kind of crappy, right? Have this this romance and then he she like throws him a badge and rides off at the end. Do you know what word I'm looking for? It's definitely not compadre. Simpatico? Yes, that's it. Hey, I have a question for you. (laughs) One of many, I'm sure. (laughs) Has Russell Crowe ever reminded you of a hobbit? I guess a little bit. He seems like he'd be a great hobbit. Yeah, it might be the floppy hair. Oh, yeah, he's got way floppy hair in this. Yep. Floppy hair and kind of like a goodness in his face. (laughs) Yeah, a goodness. Yeah, he's got like a good face. Yeah, I guess. When he smiles, he looks jolly, right? But Russell Crowe, when he's mad, he's mad. And he's often mad. Oh, you mean like cell phone throwing mad? Before cell phones. This is like a hotel desk phone. Oh, he threw hotel desk phones before he threw cell phones? Yep. Dangerous. His first American movie, The Quick and the Dead. It turns out after Basic Instinct, I have to assume, because that's the one that made Sharon Stone a star. Apparently, she had a lot of clout. Co-produces this movie. Fought so hard for a a baby-faced nothing actor named Leonardo DiCaprio to be included. Uh, When the studio balked, she paid his salary out of her pocket. And insisted on a handpicked Russell Crowe and picked Sam Raimi to direct. Wow. So are we saying that Sharon Stone basically made those three careers? Yeah, it's very weird to think. Uh, Russell Crowe still credits her with, you know, with his success. Leonardo DiCaprio had done A Boy's Life and stuff, and he was kind of a rising star. But yeah, Kelly Ray watched it with me. She didn't know anything about it. She missed the credits, and she was like, wait, that's just a kid that looks like Leonardo DiCaprio, right? (laughs) (laughs) It's how young he looked. We know Oscar winners Russell Crowe and Leonardo DiCaprio. And it may be less obvious to some, you know, non-hardcore movie fans. What did Sam Raimi go on to do? He was responsible prior for the Evil Dead movies. Uh, Of course, the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man. And then most recently, we're reviewing The Quick and the Dead because I refuse to review Sam Raimi's 2022 Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. I haven't seen it. It was very, how shall I put it, Sam Raimi. Yeah, we got 10, maybe 15 minutes into this movie, and Brian was like, who directed this? And I was like, Sam Raimi. And he was like, oh, that explains the cheesiness. Yes, that explains the cheesiness. (laughs) And I thought that this was Sam Raimi's best movie. And then I realized that it's not Sam Raimi's best movie. I was shocked to find that he also directed A Simple Plan. 
Oh, that's a good movie. And that's what I'm saying. So, But how much of the simple plan has to do with the writing? It's a great script. That's probably it. And because it's not flashy, you can't muck it up too much. Whereas, man, when you talk about flashy, when I think about gunslinging westerns, like not the serious uh, unforgiven type, this is immediately what I think of. The unforgiven type being like the more even-handed, authentic type? I guess so. But Gene Hackman's character was almost identical. Yeah, except I hated Gene Hackman even more in this movie. (laughs) Was it because of the cheesiness or just his downright cruelty? His downright evil cruelty. I hated him. I was like, so every time he was on the screen, I was like growling. You weren't the only one growling in this movie. (laughs) Who's growling? The Well, Scars growls. (laughs) <laughs> he gets, he's like, everybody, when they're introduced, you can tell they're bad guys because they go. <laughs> True. <laughs> like you the do. child molester dude. His very first yeah. line it was like grunts and just. Eh. Yeah. They're always sizing her up and like looking her up and down. And then they like punctuate it with a. <laughs> before they move on. Oh, man. He's just so detestable. I mean, I don't have anything against Gene Hackman, the actor. In fact, he probably should be applauded for his menacing performances. But the characters, ugh, I just want to punch him in the face. (laughs) Seriously. Question, spoiler, Leonardo DiCaprio dies in this movie. But when he dies... And he starts sobbing that he doesn't want to die. And it's very sad. And his obviously like strong demeanor falls away. I thought that was actually kind of a touching scene. And his dad is standing over him, holding his bleeding neck where his son just shot him after he shot his kid. And he's trying to reason to rationale. Like, you know, I gave him a way out and it was never confirmed he was my son. And he doesn't cry because that's not what Herod does. But in a way, it was touching. Like, that's probably the most emotionally complete and raw scene for me in the movie. Like, I actually kind of felt something for Herod just for a moment in that scene. For Herod or for the kid or for both? For Herod, obviously for Leonardo DiCaprio because he's sobbing or whatever. But then they had the the wistful guitar music. Doom, but a little doom, (laughs) doom, doom, doom. And you're like, oh, I kind of feel bad for Herod. He didn't have a choice. I thought you were going to say that that was one of the most raw, resonant moments with Leonardo DiCaprio. Because I thought that was a great performance. I totally felt it. I, I think it's safe to say that everyone likes the kid, right? Yeah. And then, but for someone you hate as loathe as much as Herod, maybe he kind of felt bad for him. No? I mean, especially when she walks up to him and challenges him and he's like, go away. Because he's like all sad that he has to fight his kid. That's right. There was something there. I'm not saying that these roles aren't completely transparent and flat, but there's a little bit of nuance there because he's Gene Hackman. I think he's so in denial that I can muster up a little pity for him. A little. But that's about it for Herod. Well, good, because he gets his. He gets his comeuppance. I wasn't clear. Does the lady do the deed or is it the preacher? Because the preacher's in the background, like backing her up. Who shot him? Yeah. No, it's 100% her. She's just, he's just the enforcer shooting the gunman and making sure all the fights are fair, John. Are you sure? Because I thought it was one of those like Ringo Doc Holiday moments where Wyatt Earp's like, can I beat him? And Doc Holiday's like, nope. Are you suggesting that the quick and the dead has nuance and that we didn't see it, but court actually shot Herod? I don't think so. I think so. She had to be. It had to be someone closer to him, like Ellen, because when she shot him, he flew through the air in a dramatic somersault and landed (laughs) on his face. And no, it's like a 360 degree flip. It's cheesy all the way through, but it's really cheesy at the end, right? You know what? No, no. He's standing there and... (laughs) (laughs) And he gets blown off his feet. So by that time, I got it. I finally got it. It took me like two thirds of the movie. But when the Native American, what's his name? Spotted horse cannot be killed by a bullet. Uh, when, Sp- when Spotted Horse thrusts his hand in that final, ap- you know, like dead <laughs> moment, like the third time he dies, I was like, oh, I finally get this movie's tone. It took me a long time. But at that point, I was in. And so at the end, I was like, okay, yeah, bring it. (laughs) Right? When the sunlight is shining through the hole in his body from the bullet. (laughs) Right. You can see it in his shadow. Oh, man. They can't feel it. They got to see it, right? (laughs) I guess so. (laughs) But it's pretty cheesy. But I'm going to, I think we should go to the boards for this. And I think we should find out if there are other people who believe that court actually is responsible for taking down Herod. Okay, I'm sure this will be a worthy endeavor. 
How much do you love The Quake and the Dead? Honestly, this is purely, I mean, this is like a video game. If there was a quick draw, unforgiven video game, this would be it, right? Where you select <laughs> your character and you go up against Scars or Captain Cantrell or whatever. And you select the character and he's like, Grr. or Captain Cantrell's like, <laughs> he's like, <laughs> I can't do the Keith David laugh. But it was so cheesy, and there were so many gunfights, and it was so completely implausible. I watched this movie purely for the gunplay, which is actually pretty cool. And so that's interesting to me because I would think that upon repeat viewing, how many times have you seen this? I don't know, probably half a dozen. That the gunfighting, right, the structure of the story could get a little tedious. Yeah, but Sam Raimi knew that there were many, many gunfights, and he tried to make each one different or unique or like a video game. Every character has their strengths and their weaknesses, and some are slower, but some are more accurate, and et cetera, and some are they're hampered by their pride or whatever. Is there any historical significance to this story? No. <laughs> <laughs> That no was like, how dare you try and add importance to this film? I'm not even sure that gunfights really happened. I mean, when you look at the gunfighters of the era, there were only one or two that actually legitimately were involved in quick draw things. I mean, yes, they were faster because they were they lived by their wits and by their guns or whatever. But these kinds of contests, who signed like how could this town they're like so tired of Herod and they want out so badly that they'll just be like, let's have a thing every year where we kill each other and like eighteen people will die or get injured. <laughs> like the rules of the contest are pretty ambiguous, right? You're not really sure if they're fighting to the death until Herod says it's to the death from now on. Right, right. And so you're like kind of surprised when the Swedish guy is like, I only have one you kid and you're like, Oh, they're they're not killing each other, right. but they're kind of killing each other. Like if they kill each other, it's okay. Right. Only the top tier people would be able to like shoot not to kill in the arm or the leg or whatever. Right. It's pretty implausible. And you can, it's like the purge old West style, right? Where you have your little grudge and you settle it in the, on the official day. Yeah, I guess so. Old West purge makes a lot of sense, but it seems like life is cheaper than even in the purge days. Like old West life is like cheap. How, how is that? If it's so hard to survive, wouldn't that make it even more worthwhile to save if you like reach adulthood? Yes, I'm saying there's no a, hardly a basis in reality. Everyone's like all dirty and has poor hygiene and stuff, but all the guns are shiny and stuff. Except for, yeah, I did want to point out that Leonardo DiCaprio is squeaky clean. I guess he's a bit of a dandy, but like that anime hair won't stop. I don't know what anime hair means, but he's definitely a, a spoiled rich kid acting out as modern rich kids do, right? He thinks he's the bomb and rides around with his guns and his expensive duds. <laughs> no, and he doesn't look any younger than in his suit at the end, playing grown up. Yeah. Another deleted scene, he actually married the redhead. No, I think he does because, or at least she, he's engaged because at that last moment when she's, the redhead like kind of mocks Sharon Stone at a moment and she like, sh she throws up her ring finger. Did you see that? Uh, I didn't explicitly note the ring. I thought she was throwing up gang signs or something. <laughs> But it was definitely like, hey, get over here when he goes to congratulate the lady after, you know, her fight or whatever. And so there's jealousy there for sure. But yeah. it's all smiles and hugs in the wedding scene and the deleted scene. Oh, well, that's kind of nice. Life is hard, but finding a really great podcast makes the days go by so much easier. Hi, my name is Blue Tulusma. I'm a writer, an emotional intelligence coach, and the host of Humanize with Blue Tulusma, a podcast where we believe that when you humanize everyone in the room, a great conversation is almost guaranteed. Join us every week here on Electricast as me and my guest co-hosts unpack big topics and interview even bigger personalities with a sense of humor and a dash of mischief. If you're looking for a new best friend in your head, we've got you covered. Electric acid. Do Romeo and Juliet get married? I think so, so they can bone because they're like 14. <laughs> Wait, so this is 19... Yeah, this is right before Romeo and Juliet. So no one really knew who Leonardo DiCaprio was in mainstream movies. But I chose this movie because it's just so rife with people that, like, whoa, like, what are they doing here? And they keep coming. Yeah, and there are all these people that we have been discussing recently, like Lance Henriksen from Piranha 2. Yep. Commissioner Gordon from Batman was here. Um, Mr. Barney? Mr. Barnfly? Barnfly. The scary dude from Home Alone. 
Old Man Marley. Oh, the Shovel Slayer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the one that threw uh, Kelly Ray for a loop. She was like, who is that guy? And I'm like, I don't know. He's the doc. Yeah, he's old man Marley. And then uh, yeah. Lieutenant Dan from Forrest Gump. Lieutenant Dan, yeah. Which, you know, a bit of a misdirect, right? You think that maybe he's her love interest, but she, but he's her daddy. <laughs> I did not think that he was that little girl's love interest. Not for a second. No, no. In the when she's looking at the little <laughs> locket thing as an adult, I thought, oh, she's coming to town looking for her love, Gary Sinise. Yeah, I don't know. I was a kid when uh, this I saw this movie, so I don't remember it any other way. Mm. Like nothing in the repeat viewing was was a surprise to me. No, and why would it be? What about Spotted Horse? Spotted Horse cannot be killed by a bullet. <laughs> what about him? I'm looking at his filmography too. Looks like this and Geronimo were his big hits. Man. What happened to Spotted Horse? I'm pretty sure he faked his own death and he's still out there shooting people. <laughs> Okay, so do you want a pop quiz? Hit me. Um, name at least two of the three guns that Leonardo Whoa, DiCaprio that was, offers. He offers him a, oh man, like this is my jam too. And I don't know if I can get all the specifics because they're very complicated. There's the, first he offers him the, nope, can't remember. But, you know, cadence wise and phonetically, I'm remembering the, then there's the Remington new model. And that's the one where he had the ivory handles replaced with solid silver. And that's the one where he spins the barrel. And then there's the Smith & Wesson Schofield, the uh, meat, just meat and potatoes used in 30, no, 35 train robberies. He and Jesse James think it's the best gun in the world. And what was the other one? He offered 125 for this Colt and he throws him the Colt. But the first one, so I don't know if that counts. But because the, there, there are only three that he demonstrates from the case, and then he gives him the crappy Colt. No, the uh, the crappy squeaky gun. <laughs> Shoot straight, or I wouldn't sell it. Right? Don't worry, kid. I'm not gonna fire it or whatever. And so the first one was the eagle butt peacemaker. Boom. No, the <laughs> peacemaker is the one with the solid silver handles. Yep, eagle butt peacemaker, Remington new model, and the Schofield meat and potatoes gun. Boom. You looked it up. Nope. It just took a little time, but you worked it out. It was like long legs Lenore and cunning Carla. <laughs> limbs, long limbs. <laughs> right, sorry. <laughs> wow, Wes. So this is that was just a window into Wesley's brain for all of our listeners out there. <laughs> I'm gonna confirm it was the Eagle Butt Peacemaker, the Remington new model, Army forty four, and the Smith and Weston Schofield forty five. Meat and potatoes. <laughs> That's pretty good, Wes. I know. And really nerdy. What are you going to do? I have <laughs> Peacemaker replicas, and I can do all the spins and stuff, and a lot of it came from the quick and the dead. Yeah, I mean, almost as worthless as knowing this trivia. Why do you know how to spin guns? I don't know, man, because I need something to do with my hands to quiet my mind. Can you do, like, the Val Kilmer, like, coin roll or pen roll? To much less effectiveness, yeah. Are you dexterous? I mean, it takes me a while and I have to look at it. <laughs> you can't like do it on cue, like Iceman style? No. And he, he didn't do it in Top Gun. He did it with the pen. And likewise, Leonardo DiCaprio, he does get his point on in this movie, but he, he points with the gun. In fact, <laughs> I'm the new goddamn mayor of this town. He's like pointing with his gun. Yeah, because it's not just the point. It's, it's also the wiggle of the point that makes it the point. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, the gunslinging piece is fun. I mean, it's it adds a lot of flash to this. It adds character. I guess they all have their, they display their character through the gunslinging. Um, where does this land in the Western canon? So obviously Dances with Wolves kind of started it in 1990. Unforgiven really drove it home. In the 80s and things, we had the young guns, which were cool, but they weren't authentic. No one can say the quick and the dead is authentic necessarily, but it started the resurgence. Not this, Dances with Wolves and Unforgiven started the resurgence of quote unquote serious Westerns. So actually for this movie, I think the production value is pretty good. Everyone had their unique costumes as flashy and ridiculous and dandy as they were. But apparently there were so many Westerns filming in 1994 when this was filmed. So there was actually a shortage of the materials they needed to make the costumes for the quick and the dead. Which is why they branched out into some of these less conventional costumes, like for Ace, for example. I don't know. Like kimono jacket or something. Yeah. Ace is the man. 
<laughs> Reputation precedes him. Apparently, Sharon Stone's leather jacket was over 100 years old. It was like authentic. Oh, she looked great. That was a that was her best wardrobe. She went kind of natural for this role. At, le- at least you know, like movie natural. Yeah. But and this movie's a lot of fun, and it seems like people are having a lot of fun. The lady or Ellen ain't having no fun. No. She is perpetually miserable in this movie. She is. She had a hard life. He ruined her life. She in court. He. She's kind of got the aggro, and like court's got the emo thing. So they're like representing like '90s music. Yep, they should Mac. (laughs) Well, apparently they do. Yeah. So that's why he's like all giving her a hard time being like, oh, last night it was the kid. Tonight it's Herod. So, I mean, there's a lot of convention in this movie, a lot of Wild West type stuff, probably none of which took place in the Wild West. But why would you take your little derringer or knuckle duster thing to your dinner party, tie it so elaborately to your leg and then pull it on the dude and click it? Once you click the gun. You're showing your hand, right? It's time to throw down. Yeah. To quote Tuco in The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, if you're to shoot, shoot, don't talk. Or to quote Wyatt Earp, smoke that chuck wagon. (laughs) Was that right? Did I say that right? (laughs) I think that term term is accurate for like a barbecue, but his was jerk that smoke wagon. (laughs) Choke that meat chicken. Why would you pull a gun on a dude and then do the click and then wait for him to click in return so you can get all flustered and run out? Because she didn't, she was driven by a demon, but it was counter to her otherwise good nature. Yeah, she's the Sarah Connor of this piece. Yes, she was driven by the demon of her past and she, she wasn't a killer. Well, she killed the hell out of him. I think it's nice not to take this movie too seriously. I don't think it's possible. You're going to be disappointed. I wonder, though, if there are the people who are like, oh, this is way better than Unforgiven because those people exist, right? Mm. And those people are wrong. Is that what you're saying? Well, so look, Kelly's never been a huge fan of Westerns or whatever. And I sat her down and she agreed to watch this movie. And then actually, actually, she got engaged because there are lots of, you know, like surprise stars in it and stuff. She missed the credits. So a lot of the when the people popped up, she was kind of surprised. But even she was laughing at the the camera tilt zoom uh, uptown funk kind of camera angles. <laughs> and we got the eyes and the eyes and the zoom on the gun and the zoom on the clock tower and stuff. And it was very like you can't take this movie seriously because you probably won't enjoy it as much. Yeah, I think that's really accurate because the first two thirds of the movie, I was a little bit like antsy and not I didn't find my groove. And then once I found the groove and once the groove continued in this discussion, I was like, yeah, I can get behind the quick and the dead. So I think there's something to that. All right. Ready for your quiz then? Uh, Yeah. Okay. So we're not going to go too crazy because you just saw this movie for the first time. Okay. Um, how much was the quick draw contest worth? 120000 123 actually, but very close. It has to be the amount that fits in that trunk, right? In that chest? Because why would it be such, such a random amount? That's a lot of money. So your bonus question is, give or take, how much does that equate to in modern dollars? Oof. I'd say it's at least 10x. Can we say a million two? According to IMDb.com, uh, 3.3. That's a lot of money. So uh, Herod comes to Ace and says, I wanted to ask you about Indian Wells. And it was me that shot the Duffer Brothers or whatever. <laughs> the dudes that made Stranger <laughs> Things. Um, what can you compare that to in Unforgiven? Oh, I don't know. That was the Blue Bottle Saloon where uh, English Bob killing Two Gun Corcoran when in fact uh, he was there and what didn't go down the way he said. I, f- I do feel like this is almost, uh, if there's anyone that's a close character and almost a ripoff, I mean, can you rip off your own character? But it was just Gene Hackman carrying his little Bill roll over to uh, John Herod. And this is like the multiverse of gunslinging. Right, that's what I was looking for. It was just too too close. But I actually like, well, I don't like the character, but I think it's awesome to watch Gene Hackman in this movie and Russell Crowe they all worked really hard this is probably my favorite Sharon Stone role is that weird that's probably weird maybe it's a little odd for a dude maybe because she's in just such a dude centric movie casino and also total recall probably more so but this one is just pure fun and pure dumb lots of colorful characters and in a way probably for some people who like the Emilio Estevez, Billy the Kid and stuff, maybe exactly what some people want. And I love a lot of the parts of this movie. I've seen it several times, 
but it's a distinctive alternate universe from it's compartmentalized. There's Unforgiven and nothing can touch that. And then there's The Quick and the Dead, which is the opposite side on the silly side of the fence. And both have Gene Hackman to add some legitimacy to this movie, some I guess. Some like actor clout. But I'm glad this movie exists for what it's worth. I'm glad that I'm not disappointed universally by Sam Raimi movies. In a way, A Simple Plan was kind of a Western in itself, but... I'm glad that Sharon Stone got a little power and was like known for her sex appeal and then was like, I'm going to make a Western where I'm covered up and I'm going to bring all these dudes in and everybody's going to pew, 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 and growl and stuff. And it was fun and it was fine. You know, you can always tell when a movie has good intentions or knows exactly what it is. When I sit Kelly Ray down in the blind and it's like, oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> Well, pretty good is a lot different than a totally. And you've been handing out totallys like nobody's business lately. This is not the classic. This is a reference manu manual, and this is an instructional movie that helped with my gunslinging. It's been a while since I've seen the whole thing all the way through, but I'm glad I did it. And uh, yeah, I'll give this an all right rating. It's not a, it's a bad, <laughs> it's a bad movie. But a lot of the movies that we love can't hold up as cinematic classics worthy of preservation in the, you know, film registry or whatever. There's no part where I like am angry at this movie. I like watching it. I like seeing everybody in their cartoonish menace and laughing and grunting. You're pretty. <laughs> You're not. <laughs> that was pretty good. Yeah. There was something really Sharon Stoney about that. That's so weird. That's my first and only Sharon Stone impression, most likely. It's official and all right for the quick and the dead? Yep. Okay. Don't give it a boring. Why not? Because you were entertained by it. You weren't bored by it. Say it. Well, we both know, and our listeners know, that boring isn't a literal term. Man, who hurt you? <laughs> who forced you to shoot your own dad? <sighs> that's messed up. All right, I'll give it a good. <laughs> Yay. And that's our discussion on The Quick and the Dead, a movie from 1995, available and streaming on Netflix. If you liked this discussion, check out our other Western reviews, including Unforgiven. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> we should review 310 to Yuma. This is, you know, so yeah, he, uh, Gene totally Hackman ridiculous. carries over yeah. and uh, he parlays his unforgiven fame in, uh, into this movie. And then Russell Crowe picked up the gun again for 310 to Yuma about 10 years later. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your support of Or Whatever Movies. We'd love to hear from you, 818-835-0473, or whatever movies at gmail.com, and also in the form of your rating us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get podcasts and following us on social media at Or Whatever Movies. We hope you enjoyed this discussion on The Quick and the Dead, and we'll see you next time. Yeehaw! Hey, it's Tim from 50 Years of Music with 50-Year-Old White Guys the comedy podcast you had no idea you needed. Join Ben, Jeff, and me as we continue our musical road trip back through the years and around the globe. See, just when you thought all white guys were like Joe Rogan, you come across three educators trying to remember when we were cool. 50 Years of Music with 50-Year-Old White Guys. Electric Ass. Welcome to Sarah Talk Solutions. Ladies and gentlemen, you've tuned into a bit of a different type of show. I'm Sarah B and I'm your host. You can find me on my IG, which is Aussie underscore Sarah underscore LA. I talk about amazing, relevant conversations and topics and what functions that goes on in this magical, wonderful, wonderful city of the City of Angels. My IG, which is Aussie underscore Sarah underscore LA.